Section 3 of Astounding Stories 2, February 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 3 of Astounding Stories 2, February 1930. Spawn of the Stars by Charles Willard Diffin. Part 2. The big ships were vanishing in the oncoming fog. Whirls of vapor were eddying toward them in the flame-blaster air. Above them the watchers saw dimly the five gleaming bulbs. There were airplanes attacking. The tapping of machine-gun fire came to them faintly. Fast planes circled and swooped toward the enemy. An armada of big planes drove in from beyond. Formations were blocking space above. Every branch of the service was there. Thurston exulted the Army, Marine Corps, the Navy. He gripped hard at the dry ground in a paralysis of taut nerves. The battle was on, and in the balance hung the fate of the world. The fog drove in fast. Through straining eyes he tried in vain to glimpse the drama spread above. The world grew dark and gray. He buried his face in his hands. And again came the thunder. The men on the ground forced their gaze to the clouds, though they knew some fresh horror awaited. The fog clouds reflected the blue terror above. They were riven and torn, and through them black objects were falling. Some blazed as they fell. They slipped into unthought maneuvers. They darted to earth trailing yellow and black gasoline fires. The air was filled with the dread rain of death that was spewed from the gray clouds. Gone was the roaring of motors. The Air Force of the San Diego area swept in silence to the earth, whose impact alone could give kindly concealment to their flame-stricken burden. Thurston's last control snapped. He flung himself flat to bury his face in the sheltering earth. Only the driving necessity of work to be done saved the sanity of the survivors. The commercial broadcasting stations were demolished a part of the fuel for the terrible furnace across the bay. But the naval radio station was beyond on an outlying hill. The Secretary of War was in charge. An hour's work, and this was again in commission, to flash to the world the story of disaster. It told the world also of what lay ahead. The writing was plain. No profit was needed to forecast the doom and destruction that awaited the earth. Civilization was helpless. What of armies and cannon, of navies, of aircraft, when from some unreachable height these monsters within their bulbous machines could drop coldly, methodically, their diminutive bombs? And when each bomb meant shattering destruction, each explosion blasting all within a radius of miles, each followed by the blue blast of fire that melted the twisted framework of buildings, and powdered the stones to make of a proud city a desolation of wreckage, black and silent beneath the cold stars. There was no crumb of comfort for the world in the terror the radio told. Slim Riley was lying on an improvised cot when Thurston and the representative of the Bureau of Standards joined him. Four walls of a room still gave shelter in a half-wrecked building. There were candles burning. The dark was unbearable. "'Sit down,' said MacGregor quietly. "'We must think.' "'Think?' Thurston's voice had an hysterical note. "'I can't think. I mustn't think. I'll go raving crazy.' "'Yes, think,' said the scientist. "'Had it occurred to you that that is our only weapon left?' "'We must think. We must analyze.' Have these devils a vulnerable spot? Is there any known means of attack? We do not know. We must learn. Here in this room we have all the direct information the world possesses of this menace. I have seen the machines in operation. You have seen more. You have looked at the monsters themselves. At one of them, anyway. The man's voice was quiet, methodical. Mr. McGregor was attacking a problem. Problems called for concentration, not hysterics. He could have poured the contents from a beaker without spilling a drop. 
His poise was needed. They were soon to make a laboratory experiment. The door burst open to admit a wild-eyed figure that snatched up their candles and dashed them to the floor. "'Lights out!' he screamed at them. "'There's one of them coming back!' He was gone from the room. The men sprang for the door, then turned to where Riley was clumsily crawling from his couch. An arm under each of his, and the three men stumbled from the room. They looked about them in the night. The fog banks were high, drifting in from the ocean. Beneath them the air was clear. From somewhere above a hidden moon forced a pale light through the clouds. And over the ocean, close to the water, drifted a familiar shape. Familiar in its huge, sleek roundness, in its funnel-shaped base, where a soft roar made vaporous clouds upon the water. Familiar, too, in the wild dread it inspired. The watchers were spellbound. To Thurston there came a fury of impotent frenzy. It was so near. His hands trembled to tear at the door, to rip at that foul mass he knew was within. The great bulb drifted past. It was nearing the shore. But its action, its motion. Gone was the swift certainty of control. The thing settled and sank, to rise weakly with a fresh blast of gas from its exhaust. It settled again and passed waveringly on in the night. Thurston was throbbing alive with hope that was certainty. "'It's been hit!' he exulted. "'It's been hit! Quick! After it! Follow it!' He dashed for a car. There were some that had been salvaged from the less ruined buildings. He swung it quickly around where the others were waiting. "'Get a gun!' he commanded. "'Hey, you!' to an officer who appeared. "'Your pistol, man! Quick! We're going after it!' He caught the tossed gun and hurried the others into the car. "'Wait!' MacGregor commanded. "'Would you hunt elephants with a pop-gun? Or these things?' "'Yes!' the other told him, or my bare hands. Are you coming, or aren't you? The physicist was unmoved. The creature you saw, you said that it writhed in bright light. You said it seemed almost in agony. There's an idea there. Yes, I'm going with you, but keep your shirt on and think. He turned again to the officer. We need lights, he explained, bright lights. What is there? Magnesium? Lights of any kind? Wait, the man rushed off into the dark. He was back in a moment to thrust a pistol into the car. Flares, he explained. Here's a flashlight if you need it. The car tore at the ground as Thurston opened it wide. He drove recklessly toward the highway that followed the shore. The high fog had thinned to a mist. A full moon was breaking through to touch with silver the white breakers hissing on the sand. It spread its full glory on dunes and sea. One more of the countless soft nights where peace and calm beauty told of an angel's existence that made naught of the red havoc of men or of monsters. It shone on the ceaseless surf that had beaten these shores before there were men, that would thunder there still when men were no more. But to tense crouching men in the car it shone only ahead on a distant glittering speck. A wavering reflection marked the uncertain flight of the stricken enemy. Thurston drove like a maniac. The road carried them straight toward their quarry. What could he do when he overtook it? He neither knew nor cared. There was only the blind fury forcing him on within reach of the thing. He cursed as the lights of the car showed a bend in the road. It was leaving the shore. He slackened their speed to drive cautiously into the sand. It dragged at the car, but he fought through to the beach, where he hoped for firm footing. The tide was out. They tore madly along the smooth sand, breakers clutching at the flying wheels. The strange aircraft was nearer. It was plainly over the shore they saw. Thurston groaned as it shot high in the air in an effort to clear the cliffs ahead but the heights were no longer a refuge. Again it settled. It struck on the cliff to rebound in a last, futile leap. The great pear shape tilted, then shot end over end to crash hard on the firm sand. The lights of the car struck the wreck, and
and they saw the shell roll over once. A ragged break was opening, the spherical top fell slowly to one side. It was still rocking as they brought the car to a stop. Filling the lower shell, they saw dimly, was a mucus-like mass that seethed and struggled in the brilliance of their lights. MacGregor was persisting in his theory. "'Keep the lights on it!' he shouted. "'It can't stand the light!' While they watched, the hideous, bubbling beast oozed over the side of the broken shell to shelter itself in the shadow beneath. And again Thurston sensed the pulse and throb of life in the monstrous mass. He saw again in his rage the streaming rain of black airplanes. He saw, too, the bodies, blackened and charred as they saw them when they first tried rescue from the crashed ships. The smoke clouds and flames from the blasted city, where people, his people, men and women and little children, had met terrible death. He sprang from the car. Yet he faltered with a revulsion that was almost a nausea. His gun was gripped in his hand as he ran toward the monster. "'Come back!' shouted MacGregor. "'Come back! Have you gone mad?' He was jerking at the door of the car. Beyond the white funnel of their lights a yellow thing was moving. It twisted and flowed with incredible speed a hundred feet back to the base of the cliff. It drew itself together in a quivering heap. An outthrusting of rock threw a sheltering shadow. The moon was low in the west. In the blackness a phosphorescence was apparent. It rippled and rose in the dark with the pulsing beat of the jelly-like mass. And through it were showing two disks. Gray at first, they formed to black, staring eyes. Thurston had followed. His gun was raised as he neared it. Then out of the mass shot a serpentine arm. It whipped about him, soft, sticky, viscid, utterly loathsome. He screamed once it had clung to his face, then tore savagely and in silence at the encircling folds. The gun! He ripped a blinding mass from his face and emptied the automatic in a stream of shot straight toward the eyes. And he knew as he fired that the effort was useless. To have shot at the milky surf would have been as vain. The thing was pulling him irresistibly. He sank to his knees. It dragged him over the sand. He clutched at a rock. A vision was before him. The carcass of a steer, half absorbed and still bleeding on the sand of an Arizona desert. To be drawn to the smothering embrace of that glutinous mass for that monstrous appetite, he tore afresh at the unyielding folds, then knew MacGregor was beside him. In the man's hand was a flashlight. The scientist risked his life on a guess. He thrust the powerful light into the clinging serpent. It was like the touch of hot iron to human flesh. The arm struggled and flailed in a paroxysm of pain. Thurston was free. He lay gasping on the sand. But MacGregor! He looked up to see him vanish in the clinging ooze. Another thick tentacle had been projected from the main mass to sweep like a whip about the man. It hissed as it whirled about him in the still air. The flashlight was gone. Thurston's hand touched it in the sand. He sprang to his feet and pressed the switch. No light responded. The flashlight was out, broken. A thick arm slashed and wrapped about him. It beat him to the ground. The sand was moving beneath him. He was being dragged swiftly, helplessly, toward what waited in the shadow. He was smothering. A blinding glare filled his eyes. The flares were still burning when he dared look about. MacGregor was pulling frantically at his arm. Quick! Quick! he was shouting. Thurston scrambled to his feet. One glimpse he caught of a heaving yellow mass in the white light. It twisted in horrible convulsions. They ran stumblingly, drunkenly, toward the car. Riley was half out of the machine. He had tried to drag himself to their assistance. "'I couldn't make it,' he said. "'Then I thought of the flares.' "'Thank heaven,' said MacGregor with emphasis. It was your legs that were paralyzed, Riley, not your brain. Thurston found his voice. Let me have that very pistol. 
If light hurts that damn thing, I'm going to put a blaze of magnesium into the middle of it if I die for it. They're all gone, said Riley. Then let's get out of here. I've had enough. We can come back later on. He got back of the wheel and slammed the door of the sedan. The moonlight was gone. The darkness was velvet just tinged with the gray that precedes the dawn. Back in the deeper blackness at the cliff base, a phosphorescent something wavered and glowed. The light rippled and flowed in all directions over the mass. Thurston felt, vaguely, its mystery. The bulk was a vast, naked brain. Its quiverings were like visible thought-waves. The phosphorescence grew brighter. The thing was approaching. Thurston let in his clutch, but the scientist checked him. Wait! he implored. Wait! I would miss this for the world! He waved toward the east, where far distant ranges were etched in palest rows. We know less than nothing of these creatures, in what part of the universe they are spawned, how they live, where they live. Saturn, Mars, the moon. But we shall soon know how one dies. The thing was coming from the cliff. In the dim grayness it seemed less yellow, less fluid. A membrane enclosed it. It was close to the car. Was it hunger that drove it, or cold rage for these puny opponents? The hollow eyes were glaring. A thick arm formed quickly to dart out toward the car. A cloud, high above, caught the color of approaching day. Before their eyes the vile mass pulsed visibly. It quivered and beat. Then, sensing its danger, it darted like some headless serpent for its machine. It massed itself about the shattered top to heave convulsively. The top was lifted, carried toward the rest of the great metal egg. The sun's first rays made golden arrows through the distant peaks. The struggling mass released its burden to stretch its vile length toward the dark caves under the cliffs. The last sheltering fog veil parted. The thing was halfway to the high bank when the first bright shaft of direct sunlight shot through. Incredible in the concealment of night, the vast protoplasmic pod was doubly so in the glare of day. But it was there before them, not a hundred feet distant, and it boiled in vast, tortured convulsions. The clean sunshine struck it, and the mass heaved itself into the air in a nauseous eruption, then fell limply to the earth. The yellow membrane turned paler. Once more the staring black eyes formed to turn hopelessly toward the sheltering globe. Then the bulk flattened out on the sand. It was a jelly-like mound, through which trembled endless quivering palpitations. The sun struck hot, and before the eyes of the watching, speechless men was a sickening, horrible sight, a festering mass of corruption. The sickening yellow was liquid. It seethed and bubbled with liberated gases. It decomposed to purplish fluid streams. A breath of wind blew in their direction. The stench from the hideous pool was overpowering, unbearable. Their heads swam in the evil breath. Thurston ripped the gears into reverse, nor stopped until they were far away on the clean sand. The tide was coming in when they returned. Gone was the vile putrescence. The waves were lapping at the base of the gleaming machine. "'We'll have to work fast,' said MacGregor. "'I must know. I must learn.' He drew himself up into the shattered shell. It was of metal some forty feet across its framework a maze of lattice struts. The central part was clear. Here in a wide, shallow pan the monster had rested. Below this was tubing, intricate coils, massive, heavy, and strong. MacGregor lowered himself upon it, Thurston was beside him. They went down into the dim bowels of the deadly instrument. Hydrogen! The physicist was staring. Hydrogen! There's our starting point. A generator, obviously forming the gas. From what? They couldn't compress it. They couldn't carry it or make it. Not the volume that they evolved. But they did it. They did it. Close to the coils a dim light was glowing. 
it was a pinpoint of radiance in the half-darkness about them. The two men bent closer. "'See,' directed MacGregor, "'it strikes on this mirror, bright metal and parabolic. It disperses the light, doesn't concentrate it. Ah, here is another and another. This one is bent, broken. They are adjustable. Hmm. Micrometer accuracy for reducing the light. This last one could reflect through this slot. It's the light that does it, Thurston. It's the light that does it. Does what? Thurston had followed the other's analysis of the diffusion process. The light that would finally reach that slot would be hardly perceptible. It's the agent, said MacGregor, the activator, the catalyst. What does it strike upon? I must know. I must. The waves were splashing outside the shell. Thurston turned in a feverish search of the unexplored depths. There was a surprising simplicity, an absence of complicated mechanism. The generator, with its tremendous braces to carry its thrust to the framework itself, filled most of the space. Some of the cribs were thicker, he noticed. Solid metal, as if they might carry great weights. Resting upon them were ranged numbers of objects. They were like eggs, slender and inches in length. On some were propellers. They worked through the shells on long slender rods. Each was threaded finely. An adjustable arm engaged the thread. Thurston called excitedly to the other. Here they are, he said. Look, here are the shells. Here's what blew us up. He pointed to the slim shafts with their little propeller-like fans. Adjustable, see? Unwind in their fall. Set them for any length of travel. Fires the charge in the air. That's how they wiped out our air fleet. There were others without the propellers. They had fins to hold them nose downward. On each nose was a small rounded cap. Detonators of some sort, said MacGregor. We've got to have one. We must get it out quick. The tide's coming in. He laid his hands upon one of the slim, egg-shaped things. He lifted, then strained mightily. But the object did not rise. It only rolled sluggishly. The scientist stared at it, amazed. Specific gravity, he exclaimed, beyond anything known. There's nothing on earth. There is no such substance, no form of matter. His eyes were incredulous. Lots to learn, Thurston answered grimly. We've yet to learn how to fight off the other four. The other nodded. Here's the secret, he said. These shells liberate the same gas that drives the engine. Solve one, and we solve both. Then we learn how to combat it. But how to remove it, that is the problem. You and I can never lift this thing out of here. His glance darted about. There was a small door in the metal beam. The groove in which the shells were placed led to it. It was a port for launching the projectiles. He moved it, opened it. A dash of spray struck him in the face. He glanced inquiringly at his companion. Dare we do it? he asked. Slide one of them out? Each man looked long into the eyes of the other. Was this, then, the end of their terrible night? One shell to be dropped, then a bursting volcano to blast them to eternity. The boys in the plains risked it, Thurston said quietly. They got theirs. He stopped for a broken fragment of steel. Try one with a fan on. It hasn't a detonator. The men pried at the slim thing. It slid slowly toward the open port. One heave and it balanced on the edge, then vanished abruptly. The spray was cold on their faces. They breathed heavily with the realization that they still lived. There were days of horror that followed, horror tempered by a numbing paralysis of all emotions. There were bodies by thousands to be heaped in the pit where San Diego had stood to be buried beneath countless tons of debris and dirt. Trains brought in an army of helpers. Airplanes came with doctors and nurses and the beginning of a mountain of supplies. The need was there, it must be met. Yet the whole world was waiting while it helped, waiting for the next blow to fall. 
Telegraph service was improvised and radio receivers rushed in. The news of the world was theirs once more. And it told of a terrified, waiting world. There would be no temporizing now on the part of the invaders. They had seen the airplanes swarming from the ground. They would know an aerodrome next time from the air. Thurston had noted the windows in the great shell, windows of dull-colored glass, which would protect the darkness of the interior, essential to life for the horrible occupant, but through which it could see. It could watch all directions at once. The great shell had vanished from the shore. Pounding waves and the shifting sands of high tide had obliterated all trace. More than once had Thurston uttered devout thanks for the chance shell from an anti-aircraft gun that had entered the funnel beneath the machine, had bent and twisted the arrangement of mirrors that he and McGregor had seen, and, exploding, had cracked and broken the domed roof of the bulb. They had learned little, but McGregor was up north within reach of Los Angeles laboratories. He had with him the slim cylinder of death. He was studying, thinking. Telephone service had been established for official business. The whole nationwide system, for that matter, was under military control. The Secretary of War had flown back to Washington. The whole world was on a war basis. War and none knew where they should defend themselves, nor how. An orderly rushed Thurston to the telephone. "'You are wanted at once. Los Angeles calling.' The voice of McGregor was cool and unhurried as Thurston listened. "'Grab a plane, old man,' he was saying, "'and come up here on the jump.' The phrase brought a grim smile to Thurston's tired lips. "'Hell's popping!' the Secretary of War had added, on that evening those long ages before. Did McGregor have something? Was a different kind of hell preparing to pop? The thoughts flashed through the listener's mind. "'I need a good deputy,' McGregor said. "'You may be the whole works, may have to carry on, but I'll tell you it all later. Meet me at the Biltmore.' "'In less than two hours,' Thurston assured him. A plane was at his disposal. Riley's legs were functioning again after a fashion. They kept the appointment with minutes to spare. "'Come on,' said McGregor. "'I'll talk to you in the car.' The automobile whirled them out of the city to race off upon a winding highway that climbed into far hills. There was twenty miles of this. McGregor had time for his talk. "'They've struck,' he told the two men. They were over Germany yesterday. The news was kept quiet. I got the last report a half hour ago. They pretty well wiped out Berlin. No air force there. France and England sent a swarm of planes from the reports. Poor devils. No need to tell you what they got. We've seen it firsthand. They headed west over the Atlantic, the four machines. Gave England a burst or two from high up, paused over New York, then went on but they're here somewhere, we think. Now listen, how long was it from the time when you saw the first monster until we heard from them again? Thurston forced his mind back to those days that seemed so far in the past. He tried to remember. Four days, broke in Riley. It was the fourth day after we found the devil feeding. Feeding, interrupted the scientist. That's the point I'm making. Four days. Remember that. And we knew they were down in the Argentine five days ago. That's another item kept from an hysterical public. They slaughtered some thousands of cattle. There were scores of them found where the devils, I'll borrow Riley's word, where the devils had fed. Nothing left but hide and bones. And mark this, that was four days before they appeared over Berlin. Why? Don't ask me. Do they have to lie quiet for that period miles up there in space? God knows. Perhaps. These things seem outside the knowledge of a deity. But enough of that. Remember, four days. Let us assume that there is this four days waiting period. It will help us to time them. I'll come back to that later. Here's what I've been doing. We know that light is a means of attack. 
I believe that the detonators we saw on those bombs merely opened a seal in the shell and forced in a flash of some sort. I believe that radiant energy is what fires the blast. What is it that explodes? Nobody knows. We have opened the shell, worked in the absolute blackness of a room a hundred feet underground. We found in it a powder, two powders to be exact. They are mixed. One is finely divided, and the other rather granular. Their specific gravity is enormous, beyond anything known to physical science, unless it would be the hypothetical neutron masses we think are in certain stars. But this is not matter as we know matter. It is something new. Our theory is this. The hydrogen atom has been split, resolved into components, not of electrons and the proton centers, but held at some halfway point of decomposition. Matter composed only of neutrons would be heavy beyond belief. This fits the theory in that respect. But the point is this. When these solids are formed, they are dense. They represent a cubic centimeter, possibly a cubic mile of hydrogen gas under normal pressure. That's a guess, but it will give you the idea. Not compressed, you understand, but all the elements present in other than elemental form for the reconstruction of the atom, for a million billions of atoms. Then the light strikes it. These dense solids become instantly a gas, miles of it held in that small space. There you have it. The gas, the explosion, the entire absence of heat, which is to say it's terrific cold when it expands. Slim Riley was looking bewildered but game. Sure, I saw it snow, he affirmed. So I guess the rest must be okay. But what are we going to do about it? You say light kills them and fires their bombs. But how can we let light into those big steel shells, or the little ones either? Not through those thick walls, said McGregor. Not light. One of our anti-aircraft shells made a direct hit. That might not happen again in a million shots. But there are other forms of radiant energy that do penetrate steel. The car had stopped beside a grove of eucalyptus. A barren, sun-baked hillside stretched beyond. McGregor motioned them to alight. Riley was afire with optimism. And do you believe it? he asked eagerly. Do you believe we've got em licked? Thurston, too, looked into MacGregor's face. Riley was not the only one who needed encouragement, but the gray eyes were suddenly tired and hopeless. "'You ask what I believe,' said the scientist slowly. "'I believe we are witnessing the end of the world, our world of humans, their struggles, their grave hopes and happiness and aspirations.' He was not looking at them. His gaze was far off in space. Men will struggle and fight with their puny weapons, but these monsters will win, and they will have their way with us. Then more of them will come. The world, I believe, is doomed. He straightened his shoulders. But we can die fighting, he added, and pointed over the hill. Over there, he said, in the valley beyond, is a charge of their explosive and a little apparatus of mine. I intend to fire the charge from a distance of three hundred yards. I expect to be safe, perfectly safe. But accidents happen. In Washington, a plane is being prepared. I have given instructions through hours of phoning. They are working night and day. It will contain a huge generator for producing my ray. Nothing new just the product of our knowledge of radiant energy up to date. But the man who flies that plane will die horribly. No time to experiment with protection. The rays will destroy him, though he may live a month. I am asking you, he told Cyrus Thurston, to handle that plane. You may be of service to the world. You may find you are utterly powerless. You surely will die but you know the machines and the monsters. Your knowledge may be of value in an attack." He waited. The silence lasted for only a moment. "'Why, sure,' said Cyrus Thurston. 
He looked at the eucalyptus grove with earnest appraisal. The sun made lovely shadows among their stripped trunks. The world was a beautiful place. A lingering death, MacGregor had intimated, and horrible. "'Why, sure,' he repeated steadily. Slim Riley shoved him firmly aside to stand facing MacGregor. "'Sure, hell,' he said. "'I'm your man, Mr. MacGregor.' "'What do you know about flying?' he asked Cyrus Thurston. "'You're good, for a beginner. But men like you two have got brains, and I'm thinking the world will be needing them. Not me. All I'm good for is holding a shtick. His brogue had returned to his speech and was evidence of his earnestness. "'And besides—' The smile faded from his lips and his voice was suddenly soft. Them boys we saw take their last flip was just pilots to you, just a bunch of good fighters. Well, they're buddies of mine. I fought beside some of them in France. I belong." He grinned happily at Thurston. "'Besides,' he said, "'what do you know about dog-fights?' MacGregor gripped him by the hand. "'You win,' he said. "'Report to Washington. The Secretary of War has all the dope.' He turned to Thurston. Now for you. Get this. The enemy machines almost attacked New York. One of them came low, then went back, and the four flashed out of sight toward the west. It is my belief that New York is next. But the devils are hungry. The beast that attacked us was ravenous, remember. They need food and lots of it. You will hear of their feeding, and you can count on four days. Keep Riley informed. That's your job. Now I'm going over the hill. If this experiment works, there's a chance we can repeat it on a larger scale. No certainty, but a chance. I'll be back. Full instructions at the hotel in case." He vanished into the scrub growth. Not exactly encouraging, Thurston pondered. But he's a good man, Mac, a good egg. Not as big a brain as the one we saw but perhaps it's a better one, cleaner, and it's working." They were sheltered under the brow of the hill, but the blast from the valley beyond rocked them like an earthquake. They rushed to the top of the knoll. MacGregor was standing in the valley. He waved them a greeting and shouted something unintelligible. The gas had mushroomed into a cloud of steamy vapor. From above came snowflakes to whirl in the churning mass then fall to the ground. A wind came howling about them to beat upon the cloud. It swirled slowly back and down the valley. The figure of MacGregor vanished in its smothering embrace. "'Exit, MacGregor,' said Cyrus Thurston softly. He held tight to the struggling figure of Slim Riley. "'He couldn't live a minute in that atmosphere of hydrogen,' he explained. "'They can, the devils but not a good egg like Mac. It's our job now, yours and mine." Slowly the gas retreated, lifted to permit their passage down the slope. MacGregor was a good prophet. Thurston admitted that when, four days later, he stood on the roof of the Equitable Building in Lower New York. The monsters had fed as predicted. Out in Wyoming a desolate area marked the place of their meal where a great herd of cattle lay smothered and frozen. There were ranch houses, too, in the circle of destruction, their occupants frozen stiff as the carcasses that dotted the plains. The country had stood tense for the following blow. Only Thurston had lived in certainty of a few days' reprieve, and now had come the fourth day. In Washington was Riley. Thurston had been in touch with him frequently. Sure, it's a crazy machine, the pilot had told him, and tis not much I think of it at all. Neither bullets nor guns, just this big glass contraption and speed. She's fast, man, she's fast, but it's little hope I have. And Thurston, remembering the scientist's words, was heartless and sick with dreadful certainty. There were aircraft ready near New York. It was generally felt that here was the next objective. The enemy had looked it over carefully. 
and Washington, too, was guarded. The nation's capital must receive what little help the aircraft could afford. There were other cities waiting for destruction. If not this time, later. The horror hung over them all. The fourth day. And Thurston was suddenly certain of the fate of New York. He hurried to a telephone. Of the Secretary of War he implored assistance. "'Send your planes,' he begged. "'Here's where we will get it next. Send Riley. Let's make a last stand. Win or lose.' "'I'll give you a squadron,' was the concession. "'What difference whether they die there or here?' The voice was that of a weary man, weary and sleepless and hopeless. "'Good-bye, sigh, old man.' The click of the receiver sounded in Thurston's ear. He returned to the roof for his vigil. To wait, to stride nervously back and forth in impotent expectancy. He could leave, go out into open country. But what were a few days, or months, or a year, with this horror upon them? It was the end. MacGregor was right. Good old Mac. There were airplanes roaring overhead. It meant, Thurston abruptly was cold, a chill gripped at his heart. The paroxysm passed. He was doubled with laughter. Or was it he who was laughing? He was suddenly buoyantly carefree. Who was he that it mattered? Cyrus Thurston, an ant, and their ant hill was about to be snuffed out. He walked over to a waiting group and clapped one man on the shoulder. Well, how does it feel to be an ant? he inquired, and laughed loudly at the jest. You and your millions of dollars, your acres of factories, your steamships, railroads. The man looked at him strangely and edged cautiously away. His eyes, like those of the others, had a dazed, stricken look. A woman was sobbing softly as she clung to her husband. From the streets far below came a quavering shrillness of sound. The planes gathered in climbing circles. Far on the horizon were four tiny, glinting specks. Thurston stared until his eyes were stinging. He was walking in a waking sleep as he made his way to the stone coping beyond which was the street far below. He was dead, dead, right this minute. What were a few minutes more or less? He could climb over the coping, none of the huddled, fear-gripped group would stop him. He could step out into space and fool them, the devils. They could never kill him. What was it MacGregor had said? Good egg, MacGregor. But we can die fighting. Yes, that was it. Die fighting. But he couldn't fight. He could only wait. Well, what were the others doing, down there in the streets, in their homes? He could wait with them, die with them. He straightened slowly and drew one long breath. He looked steadily and unafraid at the advancing specks. They were larger now. He could see their round forms. The planes were less noisy. They were far up in the heights, climbing, climbing. The bulbs came slantingly down. They were separating. Thurston wondered vaguely. What had they done in Berlin? Yes, he remembered. Placed themselves at the four corners of a great square and wiped out the whole city in one explosion. Four bombs dropped at the same instant while they shot up to safety in the thin air. How did they communicate? Thought transference, most likely. Telepathy between those great brains, one to another. A plane was falling. It curved and swooped in a trail of flame, then fell straight toward the earth. They were fighting. Thurston stared above. There were clusters of planes diving down from on high. Machine guns stuttered faintly. Machine guns, toys, brave, that was it. We can die fighting. His thoughts were far off. It was like listening to another's mind. The air was filled with swelling clouds. He saw them before the blast struck where he stood. The great building shuddered at the impact. There were things falling from the clouds, wrecks of planes, blazing and shattered. 
still came others. He saw them faintly through the clouds. They came in from the west. They had gone far to gain altitude. They drove down from the heights. The enemy had drifted. They were over the bay. More clouds and another blast thundering at the city. There were specks, Thurston saw, falling into the water. Again the invaders came down from the heights where they had escaped their own shattering attack. There was the faint roar of motors behind from the south. The squadron from Washington passed overhead. They surely had seen the fate that awaited. And they drove on to the attack, to strike at an enemy that shot instantly into the sky leaving crashing destruction about the torn dead. "'Now,' said Cyrus Thurston aloud. The big bulbs were back. They floated easily in the air, a plume of vapor billowing beneath. They were ranging to the four corners of a great square. One plane only was left, coming in from the south, a lone straggler, late for the fray. One plane. Thurston's shoulders sagged heavily. All they had left. It went swiftly overhead. It was fast, fast. Thurston suddenly knew. It was Riley in that plane. "'Go back, you fool!' he was screaming at the top of his voice. "'Back, back, you poor damned decent Irishman!' Tears were streaming down his face. "'His buddies,' Riley had said, and this was Riley, driving swiftly in, alone, to avenge them. He saw dimly as the swift plane sped over the first bulb, on and over the second. The soft roar of gas from the machines drowned the sound of his engine. The plane passed them in silence to bank sharply toward the third corner of the forming square. He was looking them over, Thurston thought, and the damn beasts disregarded so contemptible an opponent. He could still leave. For God's sake, Riley, beat it! Escape! Thurston's mind was solely on the fate of the lone voyager, until the impossible was borne in upon him. The square was disrupted. Three great bulbs were now drifting. The wind was carrying them out toward the bay. They were coming down in a long, smooth descent. The plane shot like a winged rocket at the fourth great shining ball. To the watcher, aghast with sudden hope, it seemed barely to crawl. The ray! The ray! Thurston saw, as if straining his eyes had pierced through the distance to see the invisible. He saw from below the swift plane, the streaming, intangible ray. That was why Riley had flown closely past and above them. The ray poured from below. His throat was choking him, strangling. The last enemy took alarm. Had it seen the slow sinking of its companions, failed to hear them in reply to his mental call, the shining pear shape shot violently upward. The attacking plane rolled to a vertical bank as it missed the threatening clouds of exhaust. And do you know about dogfights? And Riley had grinned. Riley belonged. The bulb swelled before Thurston's eyes in its swift descent. It canted to one side to head off the struggling plane that could never escape, did not try to escape. The steady wings held true upon their straight course. From above came the silver meteor. It seemed striking at the very plane itself. It was almost upon it before it belched forth the cushioning blast of gas. Through the forming clouds a plane bored in swiftly. It rolled slowly, was flying upside down. It was under the enemy. Its ray. Thurston was thrown a score of feet away to crash helpless into the stone coping by the thunderous crash of the explosion. There were fragments falling from a dense cloud, fragments of curved and silvery metal. The wing of a plane danced and fluttered in the air. He fired its bombs, whispered Thurston in a shaking voice. He killed the other devils where they lay. He destroyed this with its own explosive. He flew upside down to shoot up with the ray to set off its shells. His mind was fumbling with the miracle of it. Clever pilot Riley in a dogfight. And then he realized. 
Cyrus Thurston, millionaire sportsman, sank slowly, numbly to the roof of the equitable building that still stood. And New York was still there, and the whole world. He sobbed weakly, brokenly. Through his dazed brain flashed a sudden, mind-saving thought. He laughed foolishly through his sobs. And you said he'd die horribly, Mac, a horrible death. His head dropped upon his arms, unconscious and safe, with the rest of humanity. End of Section 3 of Astounding Stories 2, February 1930 Spawn of the Stars by Charles Willard Diffin